Well, hey, one more thing before we get going here. Um, on your seat, you've probably seen this because uh, you sat on it if you didn't. But uh, there, uh, w- there's been a conversation going on. Uh, it says, over the past few months, elders and pastors have been discussing changing service times on Sunday morning to bring families together. Uh, we're requesting, we are requesting your input in the process. Please check the box next to the service times that you prefer then the service time that you would regularly attend in that configuration, and then last of all, drop it in an offering box before leaving. We recognize that you're here on Saturday night, so this may have no impact on your thought process, but if, um, I guess maybe the way to look at this for you guys is if you were going to come on a Sunday morning, there's a weekend, you cannot make a Saturday night, um, fill it out with that thought process. Um, What we really want to do here is just have an idea of um, are we doing what's best and it's something we're constantly evaluating with service times, configuration of services and things like that. And what we want to do before we ever make a change would be to talk to you guys, um, understand what's going on um, in, in, in your perspective on this. So if you get a moment to fill that out, if you think, hey, I never come on a Sunday morning, this is irrelevant to me, that's okay. Um, but uh, if you do come on Sunday mornings uh, occasionally, fill one of those out and drop it in an offering box for us. Um, it would be very helpful to us. So with that said, now we can hop into uh, Colossians chapter 3. And uh, what we've been doing over the last several weeks here is looking at uh, the book of Colossians. We started kind of halfway through chapter 2. Um, and what we see in this book is a church that, uh, a church that the, the Apostle Paul knew, right? He understood the people in Colossae, though he had never really been to this church. He had correspondence back and forth. Uh, so he knew what was going on there. He knew the people. He knew the circumstances that they lived in. And he's writing uh, really to deal with some, uh, some false philosophy, some Greek philosophy, and some false religion. And so he deals with that. Uh, we saw that in the last chapter. He really deals with that false philosophy, that false religion. And then he starts getting into what does the Christian life actually look like. Um, and what we saw last week was uh, that, that it revolves around renewed thinking. Uh, there's a change that goes on in our minds and the way that we think. And then that renewed thinking will lead to a renewed way of living. And what we're going to look at tonight is that we're called to live a what, what this life will look like. He gives some practical things. This is what it will look like if your, your thoughts are renewed. Your, this is what it will look like to live in the name of Jesus, to do deeds in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, but as we jump into this, kind of what I, was, what, I, what I thought of as I looked at this is, what, what is the purpose of the grace of God? Why is God gracious to us? Right? And God's grace is, you know, it's unmerited. We never did anything to earn what God has given us. Nobody earned Jesus going to the cross, but he gave himself freely out of his love uh, in, and, and died for us while we were yet sinners. While we were his enemies, Jesus died for us. And that's how gracious he is to us, that he would do that for us. So what is the purpose of the grace of God? And then the, the second question is, who is the supreme object of Christianity? Now, it might seem like an obvious answer. It's Jesus, Right? That's the Sunday school answer. But, but oftentimes what happens is we become uh, focused on self. And so th- we get this sort of egocentric Christianity. And what, uh, what that is is it's an oxymoron. To be focused on self and say I'm a Christian, it, it, it doesn't jive. It doesn't mix. It's inconsistent with the person of Christ. And so one of the things that came to mind is uh, the story goes of two friends. They're out to lunch, um, and they both order steaks. They, they get together. They go to a nice steakhouse. The waiter arrives, and he's got two plates, right? They're both steaks, but one steak is much larger than the other, and he recognizes this as he walks up, and he doesn't want to give the large steak to one guy and the small to the other, so he just kind of lays them there in the middle and lets them decide. And one of the guys is a little bit quicker on his feet than the other. He grabs the big steak and puts it in front of him, puts, takes the small steak and gives it to his buddy. And his buddy's like, the nerve, I, what are you doing? I can't believe you just did that. And he's like, well, what would you do if, 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 if you had got to him first? He says, well, I would have given you the larger one, and I'd have taken the smaller. He says, well, seems like we got it then. <laughs> but we recognize that, 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 that we want to be self-serving, that we would give up self for others. We recognize that in our relationships with each other. We don't always do it, but we recognize that in our relationship with each other, self-sacrifice is one of the most admirable things that we could do. And it's what Jesus did for us, right? He gave himself on the cross. Uh, D.L. Moody says that God turns no one away empty except for those who are full of themselves. God turns away no one empty except for those who are full of themselves. themselves. And Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. 
Jesus' picture is uh, in a world of, of you know, uh, me first, in a world of uh, take care of yourself, Jesus, his message is rather than take care of yourself, I need you to die to yourself. The, the cross is an instrument of death, and he's saying take it up daily. Uh, he, take up that cross daily and recognize that in this life, if you're going to follow me, you're going to die to yourself. And it's going to be an ongoing process day by day of you taking up uh, a place of I am submissive to you and submission to you will look like service to others. And that's what he calls us to. But when you look at this, why, why did God create us in the first place? And while we can't presume to know all of the mind or motives of God, the scriptures explain why we were created. We were created to enjoy God and His grace. He created us for relationship with Him and out of a desire to have a creature to bless. Right? He wants that. Apart from everything else, He created us uh, in His image. And when we see the first word that's used of this relationship that we're to have with God is it's a blessing. The human race was made and created to know and enjoy God. He offers relationship with Him, but not because of some inherent worth in ourselves. It's not because we're so amazing. It's because he has everything and he wants uh, to bless us. He wants to give. And if we're made in his image and we're to be his image bearers, then to follow in his likeness will look like us doing the same. It will look like us having a heart that will give up self. It will, an attitude that says, I, I'm willing to give of myself for the betterment of others. If we're going to genuinely follow Jesus, that's what we'll look like. It's kind of a, it might sound like sort of a prideful thing that God would look at us and go, I am here to bless you, as though we needed it. And some people tend to look at God and, and they might think, I, I, I don't need that. I don't, I, I'm okay on my own. And, and they look at God and they say, he seems egocentric. It seems like he is the one who's full of himself, not me. But what we have to do is we have to understand what it means to be God. To, to, to think a statement like that sounds, you go, God is prideful and he's self-elevating. He's the one that says, I have everything and I can give it to you. But that sounds like he's prideful. The question you must then ask yourself is, who would you elevate above God? Who, who would God elevate above himself? Is there anyone who even remotely compares to the uncreated, eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect, righteous, holy, loving God? Who could he compare himself to? What better gift could he give than himself? To think of God as prideful and self-elevating demonstrates a great misunderstanding of what the word God means. A small, tameable God who can be placed on the same level as you and I is no God at all. So he holds this place as creator. Holy, righteous, perfect. No one else could even remotely compare. And from that place, he says, I'm going to create mankind in my image. I'm going to make you, man and woman, in my image. And, 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 and I, I call you to be my image bearers. And, and we see in the life of Jesus Christ the ultimate image of, of God. He is God become flesh. And then in the New Testament, we see that this, this life that we're to have, this new, this new covenant relationship that we're to have, is one where he conforms us to his image, that he makes us like Jesus. So the purpose of God's grace is the extension of his glory. The reason that God would give to us the way that he does is because he wants his image to cover the earth. He wants people, men and women, that are like him in their heart and in their mind. He wants people that will give the way that he gave. He wants to cover the earth with his glory through mankind. That's an amazing statement, but that's why he has us here. So then you go, well, what does that look like? What does it look like for me to receive God's grace, to reach full potential and glorify God? And I think that these verses really show us pretty clearly what that would look like. What will it look like to receive God's grace? Reach the fullness of the potential that God has for me and glorify him. What will that look like? Let's read these verses in Colossians uh, 3, starting in verse 12. He says, so, so as, those, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. 
Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom and teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual singing, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And so what he lays out here is he lays out virtues, virtues that should characterize a follower of Jesus Christ. And then he says that these virtues will result in certain things. And so what he starts with here is those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Uh, the grace of God, we see here in the first part of verse 12, the grace of God has called out a chosen people to be characterized by certain virtues. Uh, the word chosen uh, is elect. Uh, God, has, God has elected certain people unto salvation. And what we see within the scriptures, it's very clear that God is sovereign. He is in control and man is responsible. The, the picture lays out of God moving into the life of someone and, and making the truth of himself known and calling for a response. And those who he has laid out ahead of time, they will believe and they will follow him. He is fully, he is fully sovereign and man is fully responsible. And it may sound like a contradiction, but God says, I am sovereign and I am working out a plan. You are responsible to respond to it. And that's the interaction between him and man. But he, out of his grace, he has called out a chosen people to be characterized by certain, vision, uh, certain virtues. The point here is that those who have responded by drawing near through trust in Jesus will live a certain way and demonstrate certain virtues. These virtues uh, in uh, the second half of verse 12 and 13, we see these virtues lead to deeds that are selfless and Christ-like. So he says those who have been uh, chosen of God, holy, that means set apart, beloved, they, they, they have the love of God poured all over them. It says put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And so what we see here is these virtues, uh, they are selfless and Christ-like. Holy, again, is set apart. Beloved is those who are in. They have experienced, they know God's self-sacrificing love. He tells us to, to put on a heart of compassion. And we've seen throughout this that he calls us to, to, to have a certain attitude. And part of this at attitude is a heart of compassion. Uh, compassion is tenderness of thought and action towards others. Heart here refers to the seat of our emotions. He's saying, let your emotions be ruled by compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Uh, compassion is tenderness and, and of thought and action towards others. Have a heart that looks, of others and think, looks at others and thinks in a way that says, how can I understand? How can I know where they are? What questions can I ask to get where they are in life? And then what actions do I take to demonstrate that I care? Kindness is a friendly and helpful spirit which seeks to meet the needs of others. A friendly and helpful spirit that seeks to meet the needs of others. It doesn't just see a need and go, gosh, there's something going on there. But kindness says, I will take the practical steps to move into a person's life to meet the need that is there. Whatever it is. If they need truth, I will speak truth. If they need money then, and they're responsible with it, I'll give money. If they need whatever it is, I'll do it. Right? I'm not just going to see a need and do nothing about it, but I'm going to take practical actions towards meeting it, whatever it might be. Humility is lowliness of thinking. Uh, this, is or this is recognizing one's own weaknesses, but also the recognition of, power, the, of the power of God that dwells within a, believe, in a believer. Uh, the idea of humility within the scriptures is not somebody who beats themselves up or tears themselves down. It's somebody who recognizes that in and of myself, I have, I'm insufficient. But because I have the life of Christ, because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of me, there's also a recognition of the power that is within me. So I might feel like I don't, I don't have what it takes to have tenderness and care about what's going on in a person's life. I might feel like taking the steps of kindness to meet a need are not something that I feel up to doing. But because I understand that I have those weaknesses and, and in and of myself I'm insufficient, but because the love of God dwells within me, I know 
I know that God has given me everything needed in these situations. He's not going to call you to these virtues and not give you what it takes to meet them. The scriptures, and, and I see it throughout the New Testament, I through, see it throughout the Bible, but the scriptures challenge us. They say, this is what God has called you to. But they also encourage us, and they say, and he has empowered you to live it. Repetitively, that's what you see. God has called you to a high standard of living, holy and righteous. Yet, he knows that we are incapable, incapable of ourselves, and he says, but I have everything that you need to live that kind of life. And that's what humility understands. Gentleness is meekness. The word indicates an obedient submissiveness to God and his will with unwavering faith and enduring patience, <laughs> displaying itself in a gentle attitude and acts of kindness towards others. And this is even and often in the face of opposition. I, I, I am submissive to the will of God, to his word and to his will. I, I am meek towards him. I, I, will, I will do what he wants me to do, even, even if that means that I'm going to receive opposition. And the way that he's called me to respond to the opposition is not with punches back, but, but the way that Christ responded to opposition, right? When he was torn down and when he was reviled and when he was headed to the cross, he uttered no threat. He said nothing in return, but he entrusted himself to the Father, Right? And so in our lives, we will receive, if you're going to follow God, if you're, going to, if you're going to walk this path, you will receive opposition. And what he's saying is that go face it the way that Jesus did, submissive to the Father's will, entrusting all those situations to God so that you respond with gentleness, so you respond in a way that you would not in and of yourself. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience is literally long-suffering. It is the ability to bear injustices and unpleasant circumstances without revenge or retaliation, but with a view of hope in the final goal. I'm gentle. I'm not responding in the way that I might like to. Uh, I'm long-suffering. I will bear under this as long as need be. I will, I will deal with injustices in a way that Christ dealt with injustices. This is bearing with one another. This is the, you'll like this one. This is the continual act of putting up with each other. That's literally what the word means. It's putting up with each other. It's understanding that you and I are people and we will make mistakes. It's understanding that certain personalities you don't jive with. It's understanding that, that, that mistakes will be made. It's, and, and, and it's literally putting up with each other. <laughs> it's really what it means. He wants us to put up with each other. And the, and, the, and the shortfalls that, he, that we have. One of the things that you'll see with people is, and, and, and you may have had this happen in your life, you've been a part of a church, you've been a part of a body of believers, and somebody does something that injures you, that hurts you. And what a lot of people will do is they'll draw back, and they'll say, I, I'm not going to put myself out there again. I, I, this is what's happened to me in a church. I, get, I, I put myself out there. I try and serve the Lord. I try and do the right thing. I end up getting burned by people who call themselves Christians. And so they, they tend to just sort of back away and say, I'll have nothing to, I'm not, I'm not going to put myself out there in the church again because I've been hurt. Well, this says, put up with each other. He goes on, he says, forgiving each other. To be gracious and forgive even when forgiveness seems unwarranted. That's what it is to forgive someone. They may, they may never recognize the wrong that they have done. And you could have this happen within a family. You could have this happen with a fellow believer. You could have this happen in so many ways where somebody injures you and they've done something that hurts you. And he's saying, put up with it and forgive them even if, even if it's unwarranted. Even if they never say, I blew it. Even, even if they know they blew it and they won't retract from their position, he says, forgive them anyway. That's hard. But it's what Jesus did and it's what he's called us, the life he's called us to live. Yeah, he goes on and he says, uh, whoever has a complaint against anyone uh, has a complaint is a just cause for being dis dissatisfied with someone. They have done something that is genuinely wrong. You have just cause for being irritated. And he says, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. As Christ has graciously restored us to relationship with him, we should do the same for others. And this is the gospel, really. I mean, what he's, what he's saying here is he's saying, you know the gospel. 
You, you know that you have sinned against God. You know that you've rebelled against him. You know the position that he holds and how you've taken him down off that position and put either yourself or some other idol there. You've rebelled against him. You've broken his law. You've pushed him away. He has just cause to deal with us the way that he dealt with Christ on the cross. But instead of sending us there, the, the, the cup and the, and the body, or in the bread, the bread represents his body broken, his blood poured out. Instead of us going there, Jesus dies in our place and for our betterment, and he offers himself to us. And so he says, you know that gospel, and you know that Jesus has restored you to, to right relationship with him, open and bold relationship where you can approach the throne of God. That's what he's restored you to. And so if he's done that for you, do the same for others. When they've injured you, when, you're, when, you, have just, when you are just in saying, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this person, you feel like that is okay. And maybe it even is. But he says, instead, be forgiving, be gracious. Respond to that person the way that Christ has responded to you. And this is huge for marriage. This is huge for relationship with children and parents. This is huge for family relationships for us as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's huge as a testimony to the world that we live in for people who do not know the Lord Jesus. If you, if you, if you forgive them the way that Jesus has forgiven you, it speaks the gospel to them. This is huge. So these virtues lead to deeds, and they are selfless and Christ-like. Each thing there, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, um, forgiving the way that the Lord forgave us. He's saying, basically he's saying, I want you to live like Jesus. There are places in the, in the Gospels where uh, that word compassion, um, it, it's... Uh, the seat, it's our, basically our guts, our bowels, our heart. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you see someone who is in, in, a, in, in difficulty. You see a kid that's in difficulty or a family member or something, and you literally have this rising up inside of you, this welling inside of you that, 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 that wants to do something. Not just wants to do something, but will do something. There are many times in the scripture where it says Jesus felt compassion. He looked at a person in a difficult situation, and he felt compassion for them. It boiled up inside him to do something, and he did something. Uh, you can go through each of these words, and you can see where Christ lived it out. Verse 14, we see that the greatest virtue of Christ's likeness is self-sacrificial love, and this brings unity. He says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Beyond has an idea of on top or above all the others. This is the most important virtue in a believer's life is love. This love is God's kind of love. It's, self, uh, it's agape love, self-sacrificing in nature. It is willing to give up anything or, or everything for the betterment of another. Jesus gave up anything and everything to bring us in relationship to him, and he's saying, I want you to live that same way. Do not hold tightly to things, but be willing to give them up. Do not hold tightly to your own rights. Do not hold tightly to your, what you feel is, is, is rightfully yours, but be willing to let go of it in order to love and serve someone else. Love is doing something for another that very often costs us dearly. And that's what he's called us to because that's how he showed us his love. Goes on and he says, which is the perfect bond of unity. Uh, perfect has the idea of complete maturity. It lacks nothing. Bond of unity is a single Greek word that means to hold uh, that which holds something together. It's, it's the glue. Love is the glue that holds people together. A willingness to give yourself up is what will hold your relationships together. A willingness to give self up is what will make a lasting marriage. A, willing to, a willingness to give yourself up, to sacrifice self, is what will cause long-lasting relationships with your, with your children and with your family. A willingness to give yourself up for something that a coworker might be looking for. You, you actually sacrifice something you're doing in order for a coworker to advance. That will speak the gospel to them.
Verse 15, we see these virtues are brought about by a natural state of tranquility. <laughs> I'll explain this more. Uh, but these virtues are brought about by a natural state of tranquility directly opposed to 3.8 where he talked about all the, all the negative things that he wants us to take off. Also leading to unity with others and thankfulness to God. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were indeed called to one body and be thankful. Let the peace, let the peace is a natural state of tranquility. Of Christ describes, uh, Jesus described the kind of peace that he offers as different from the kind of peace that the world offers, right? When we think of worldly comfort, you probably think of a vacation, you think of a pool, you think of a beach, you think of what, a fire this time of year, right? You think of something that makes you comfortable and without worry. Jesus says, I offer you a different kind of peace. He says, you will have trouble in the world. There will be trouble while you are here on earth. Circumstances will come up that stink, but you will have peace in it anyway because I will be with you. You can have peace in cancer. You can have peace in the death of a family member. You can have peace in the loss of a job. You can have peace in not being able to make rent. You can have peace in a car full of kids that are screaming and yelling. You can have peace wherever you are. You can have peace because Jesus Christ is with you. And he takes the circumstances that we go through that are the ones that we wouldn't pick. And when we see the purpose, when we see he uses those circumstances to bring us closer to his image and so that he can shine his light through us, Right? When you, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 11, he talks about all the circumstances in life that can, that can break us apart. And he says, you're going to be delivered over to these things so that the life of Jesus can be manifested, made evident in you. I'm going to let you go through difficult circumstances, and I will be with you. And you, when you have peace in those things, you can make my life known to others. That's what he says about difficulty. And he says, you can have peace no matter what. You don't need a beach. You don't need a fireside. You don't need those things. You can go through anything and be at peace when you see the ultimate purpose that he's using you for. Uh, the word rule is to referee, to be an umpire, to call to a decision. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Uh, it, it, it's wh wh what decision are you going to make? When I have to make a decision between one action and another, when I have to make a decision between getting out of a difficult circumstance and working my way through it with peace as Christ has called me to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the peace of Christ be the deciding factor. I'm not going to seek comfort. I'm not going to seek self. I'm not going to seek ease. I will go through whatever difficult situation is laid out ahead of me knowing that Jesus Christ will use that for his glory. He's blessed me with everything that I need to, to go through difficulty, so why would I run from it? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. This is the center of physical and spiritual life. Uh, earlier on, he, he used the word heart in verse 12. This isn't the same word. Uh, that was like the center of emotions. This is the center of physical and spiritual life. Let the peace of Christ rule in the decisions that you make with your body and in your spiritual life. Whatever decision it is you're making, let the peace of Christ rule. Whether it's a spiritual decision about uh, spiritual things or whether it's a, a physical thing about what you do with material things on this earth, he's saying, let the peace of Christ rule. It says, to which indeed, which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Uh, the which indeed, this is a statement of fact. He's saying this is what you've been called to. It's a, a specific title or, or name. Uh, you, it's a fact that you have been made a part of the body of Christ. Paul uses the, the metaphor of the body uh, in his different writings with an, an emphasis that there will be unity between Christians. Right? The body is a picture of, in Corinthians, he talks about how if everybody, if the eye says to the hand, I want to be an eye, and the hand says to the foot, I want, you know, he goes through. If, if, if the body wants to be, if we as members of, of the body want to be something that we are not, he's saying we won't function the way that we should. There should be unity between us, right? And you have been called to this. This is an amazing thing as a Christian. More and more, less and less, more and more, people are interested in church less and less. More and more, people go to church less and less. And yet, this says that you've been called to one body. You've been called to be a part of the body of Christ, the church. And, and you have a part to play in it. He has a role for you in the way that he's gifted you to play in it.
We did a baptism a few weeks ago, and part of baptism is the spiritual symbol of what's taking place in us. But it's also, it's very much an initiation right into, not a club, because clubs have very weird things in common. We have Christ in common. It's, 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 a, it's a welcome statement to the church. It says, and be thankful. Uh, this is actually... Uh, thankfully become in the Greek. Reminds me, it sounds like something Yoda would say. Thankfully become. Um, but Paul's point is that the grace and peace of God is experienced uh, through personal thankfulness towards him and we will continue to grow. Uh, we, will be, we will become more and more and more thankful towards God when the peace of Christ becomes something that is experientially true to us. You're probably wondering, what is he talking about? Right? What is what is it to let the peace of Christ rule? What is that? How do, I, how do I experience that? Well, I think it is taking the difficult situations in life, the things that you would say, I would love to remove myself from this circumstance and know that God has a purpose for them. I think it, I think it is an ongoing relationship with God where you're constantly in communication with him and you, you know who he is you know his character and you know his purpose. And no, ma- and no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, if you're in that relationship with him, if you're abiding, one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. If you're abiding, then there will be, as, this, as it says here, a natural state of tranquility. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't always experience this. Um, very often when things go haywire, um, I respond in a way that this is haywire. This is weird. I don't like it, right? The tone of voice goes to a different place. Body, body rate goes, our heartbeat goes somewhere else, right? You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. Things get weird and you respond not with peace, but with, come on, right? Now, because these verses were on my mind this week, this is something that I was fully aware of. The times where when things went maybe a way I didn't see them going, when my expectations were not met, and I wanted to respond with, with, with the tension that that causes. Because these verses were on my mind, as the verse says next, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Because the Bible was dwelling richly in me, uh, God actually brought this to mind. And there were times this week where things were, where they were started to go haywire. They started to get weird. Somebody pushed my buttons and ticked me off, right? And instead of responding the way that my flesh would want to respond, this is what came to mind. And the question I had for myself in that moment is, am I experiencing the peace of Christ? Am I living in a natural state of tranquility where instead of responding with angst or worry or anger or one of those other things, I responded with kindness or gentleness or patience. And instead of my voice going way up here, it stayed down here. And instead of my body language getting like this, it stayed like this. That's what it is to experience the peace of Christ, to know that he is with you, to know that he has changed you, to know that he is making, that he is making you into his own image. And instead of responding in a way that protects self, instead of a way that, in responding in a way that promotes self, we respond with gentleness and meekness and there's calmness in us. I think that's what it is to experience the peace of Christ, to let it rule in your heart. Verse 16, we see that dwelling on the word of God, on the word of Christ, this is to study, meditate upon, and apply the Bible until it becomes a permanent, unshakable part of one's life. This this practical action is central to all Christian thinking, speech, and behavior, that I'm going to study the word of God, I'm going to meditate upon the word of God, and that I'm going to apply it to my life. That, That is a practical action that is central to everything that you do. Uh, the evidence of the word of Christ dwelling richly in a believer is wise instruction and counsel to others and heartfelt, thankful praise of God. He says, let the word of Christ dwell or richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The word, it says, let the word of Christ, the, the word word there is, is logos in the Greek. It embodies an idea or a concept 
Um, in John 1, it's, it says that the word of God became flesh. The logos of God became flesh. flesh. The concept or idea of God became flesh in Jesus Christ. Everything that we thought we knew about him became real in Jesus. And this can be, we can, so we can understand Jesus through his life and, what, and, and, and his responses to situations. We can understand Jesus through his teaching and his words. So what we, what we basically have here is this is the person and teaching of Christ, of Jesus Christ, richly dwelling within us. It, it, it takes up home. It gives a, it, the picture here is of, of, of extravagant living, right? If, 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 we put, if we put Christ in a room in our house, he gets the best one, right? We don't say, hey, we got this guest room over here where, you know, the dog sleeps too. We say, take mine, right? Dwell richly in me. Have the center of my house. Have the center of my heart. Dwell richly in me. And he says that when we give Christ that place, which by the way he deserves, Jesus Christ deserves that place. He's not a guest that shows up and you think, Oh boy, he's here. Let's figure out where we can put him. That's not what he deserves. If you understand who Jesus is, if you understand his love, if you understand him, as it says in John 1, as the concept, the idea of God becoming real to us, flesh. If you understand that he is God in flesh and you understand that this God died for your sins, that he was buried and that he was raised to new life, that he appeared to hundreds and hundreds of people, that, that, that his resurrection isn't a fairy tale but it's historically viable, and you understand that he, he now resides at the right hand of God and he's preparing a place for us that someday when, when he returns, he, he will bring us to that place, a heavenly, eternal place, relationship with him. That's who he is. He doesn't get the room out back. He doesn't get just kind of a place. He gets the center. He gets to dwell richly because that's who he is. That's what he deserves. And he says that when we'll approach Christ in this way, when we will honor him for who he truly is, and allow him that place in our lives and say, this is, it's already yours. It belongs to you. I'm just acknowledging that. It says that when we do that, it will result in wise teaching with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. We will be able to teach others. We'll be able to be in life with each other and say, I understand the situation you're going through and your marriage is tough. Let's turn to Ephesians 5 and let me talk to you about what God says about marriage. Uh, you're having a hard time with your kids. Let's look just a little further here in, in Colossians and, and he has wise teaching for you. Um, you're, you're struggling with, with why, why you would put Jesus in the center of your life. Why would you allow him to rule over everything? Let's look at what he, who he is and what he's done on the pages of, of, the, of the Gospels. Uh, I will be able to wisely instruct you based upon what is available to us here in the Bible, what God has given us. Admonishing is the idea of counseling each other. So we, we know God's word. We wisely teach. We're able to counsel and come alongside each other and point each other in the right direction. So evidence of the word of Christ richly dwelling in us, Jesus Christ having the center of our lives, is that there will be wise instruction and counsel to others. And then he goes on here and he says, um, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart. Uh, psalms is probably referring to psalms of the Old Testament. Hymns is other songs which praise God. And spiritual songs are those that are opposed to secular songs. Right? So you're probably not going to sing Sweet Home Alabama in praise to God. Um, it's a secular song. So he's saying, look at the songs that are spiritual, that, that look at life from God's perspective. And what he's saying is that when Christ dwells richly in us, it's interesting in Ephesians 5, he says that when we walk by the Spirit, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we will, we will sing and, and we'll do these same things. There'll be psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, in our lives. So it's an interesting thing. He says that part of our walk with him, part of, part of him having center of our lives is that we will go through life praising him. 
like literally singing songs throughout our day to him. I don't know if you do this or not, but there are certain songs that will get stuck in my head, and, and they'll just be there throughout the week. We also see that music is powerful, and what you put in your head musically is really important. I'm speaking mostly to teenagers here. What you listen to is really, really important, right? Um, and, and so fill your mind with spiritual songs. Fill your mind with hymns. Fill your heart with hymns and psalms. Let, 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 be what, let the song of your life that is on your heart and working through your mind, let it be a spiritual one. Let it be one that recognizes who God is. Let it be one that recognizes your relationship with him. Music is extremely powerful. And he's saying that when we dwell richly in his word, in who he is, or when we're filled with the spirit, one of the examples of that will be, one of the experiences of that will be a song on our heart to him. He says that the singing with thankfulness and hearts to your God, any of and all these songs will be heartfelt and directed towards God in thankful praise. When who Jesus Christ is is real to you, relevant to you, when when his person and his work has hold of your heart, he's saying one of the evidences of that is you're just going to praise him throughout your day. Verse 17, we see that uh, all that a Christian does is for one supreme purpose, the glory of of the one supreme person, Jesus Christ. Thomas said, upon seeing the risen Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, that's who Jesus is. He is deserving of our total devotion and utmost adoration. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Everything that you do. um, He's just saying everything. In word, your speech, your teaching, your expression of belief, whatever, whatever you speak, Let it be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, deeds or actions or things done, the same word is used in uh, in the book of James. He says, show me your faith and I'll show you my deeds. These are actions that are based upon what we believe to be true. Whatever you do with, with the words of your mouth, whatever you do with the actions of your body that express your faith, let it be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives are lived for the glory of Jesus Christ. And he says that we, when we live that way, will we give thanks through Jesus to God the Father, recognizing that only through God's grace can we live a life of fullness, can we bring him the glory that he created us to bring him. So the Christian is to be characterized by virtues that embody the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. These virtues come from graciously given new life in Christ, and these virtues bring about deeds that will bring Jesus Christ glory. This life is to be lived by the gracious transformation that God works in and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit in line with the Word of God. The Christian lives by the grace of God and for the glory of God. He is Lord and God. There is no other. This is an amazing thing. God has poured out his grace on us. And the reason he has, the reason he has given us life, the reason he has died for our sins, is so that he could raise us up and we could be his image bearers on this earth. Live like him, look like him, speak like him, point to him and say, you need to know him. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the, the goodness of getting to look at your scriptures, the written word, the, the, uh, the revelation of you. Um, this is a high calling that you have for us to live like Jesus Christ. And with full recognition, I, anyone, cannot do this on our own. So I'm challenged to the, to the high calling that you have for me, but I'm also so encouraged that you say, I give you everything you need to do it. And when you live this way, you're going you're gonna to be, be centered in my grace and you're gonna, uh, the word of Christ is going to dwell richly in you and Jesus will have the place that he deserves and because of that, you're going to bring him glory and part of that glory is blessing others. So God, may we take off anything that is self-centered and self-driven and may we put on you, the Lord Jesus, and recognize that when we do that, our lives will be selfless and we will bring you glory. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.